to the Highland Village City Council early work session. Today is April the 12th, uh, and it is 6 p.m. Look at that clock over there. It says five. Here, I have changed it. Um, it's five o'clock somewhere. It is five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Receive a presentation and discuss fees and ordinances updates relating to animal control. And who's doing that? Start it out. Okay. That's you. Chief Stewart is going to you. Perfect. Thank you for uh, letting us be here tonight with your presentation. Uh, Chief Rhyme uh, couldn't make it tonight. He's currently down in Galveston at the Texas Police Chiefs Conference. Uh, we're actually um, receiving an award there at the uh, conference for our uh, Texas Fall and Bike race and the money that we raised for officers to the state and also we're also receiving our reaccreditation from the Texas Police Chiefs Association which we've been accredited by them since 2009 so it's kind of a double presentation that they're receiving down there otherwise he would have been here for the presentation but he's at the near west tonight what we're going to be uh, covering is um, the animal services fees and some proposed ordinance updates We, uh, we have, we're going to review the animal service fees for any potential adjustments. Uh, we're going to look at the, uh, adding the animal service fees to the city master fee schedule. Also, uh, look at potentially updating our animal ordinance to allow for fees to be reduced or waived by the city manager. We look at also possibly changing the wording in the ordinance from birds to fowl. Allow for an effective, effective neighbor written permission exception on coop distance. And then I'd also address any other additional considerations <coughs> council may have. We'll go into more detail, much details of one on these as we go along or, or not. As you know, the city did a total rewrite on the animal control ordinance back in past in September. Um, in the old ordinance, the amount of fees were established in that ordinance. Under the new ordinance that got passed, the fees were said to be identified in the city master fee schedule. That never happened. So we never adopted the fees in the city master fee schedule. So that's what we want to do now. It also gives us a great opportunity to look at the fees that we had charged in the past. Uh, which actually had been in effect since 1999, so they hadn't been reviewed in a long time. And it gives us a chance to review them for adequacy, and um, and also uh, whether we want to uh, keep it simple or tier our fees or, or whatever we want to do. This section here is part of the new ordinance, and as you see, it talks about all the different types of fees um, that can be charged. And at the bottom it says the city council may authorize the city manager from time to time by resolution to reduce, refund, or waive the fees in this chapter. There's also additional fees that are authorized in the animal control ordinance that are not listed here. And um, Chief had talked with um, Mr. Laughlin earlier and that's apparently not a problem as long as the fee is mentioned in the ordinance, we can put it in the master fee schedule. So this list right here may not be an all-inclusive list of all the fees that are identified in the ordinance, if, if that makes sense. And just a reminder, um, you know, we are talking about fees and not fines, because there is a difference. Now, these are just fees that recoup our cost of doing business. It's not meant as a punitive um, action. Um, as the slide says there, we're just recouping our cost to provide this, this service. And usually, whatever fees get charged are so far below what our actual cost is um, that it really doesn't come near covering the entire cost. Here's the big list of our, our fees. And we did a comparison of uh, surrounding cities and also other cities that are similar to our size. You should have a copy of this slide um, in front of you. Uh, 
and I'd be handy to refer back to that later on. Um, once we go over this list, I'm gonna hand it over to um, um, Animal Control Officer Wes Fittis, and he's gonna go under each one of these fees in detail and have a discussion if you have any questions on what exactly that fee covers and what services he provides to provide that service, you can address those at the time. But as you see, the far left corner is our current fees that were adopted back in uh, 1999. Um, far right corner is uh, proposed fees. Now these proposed fees were just something that uh, we came up with the police department and, and talking with Wes and looking at some of the other fees. It's not um, it's definitely open for discussion. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of different things like the adoption fees. It's kind of tiered. That's kind of a complicated way to, of doing it. Um, a lot of cities are just charging one fee. So the, we just kind of need direction from council on what, what they feel we should be doing. Obviously, um, some of the adoption fees, depending on what type of animal comes in, we have do have less cost to, to us if the animal's already vaccinated and sterilized, and we don't have to provide that service to the animal to get it adopted. But anyway, we have adoption fees, um, impound fees, boarding fees, uh, deceased animal removal, euthanasia fees, excess animal permits, Exotic animal registrations, dangerous dog registrations, uh, trap permit fees, owner surrender fees, rabies quarantine fees, uh, rabies specimen testing, rabies vaccination, or kennel <coughs> vaccination, which is the kennel cough, uh, flea treatment, and veterinary bills. So we have a list of proposed fees. And then across the top, like I said, the other cities and when they uh, last updated their fee schedule. So with that, we'll go right into the adoption fees and I'll turn it over to Wes. <coughs> So my name is Wes. I'm the animal control officer for the city. I'm gonna go over a little more detail the specific fees. If you guys have any questions, just stop me and ask. I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Question up front. Why the column for flower mound? Either no data or a lot of zeros. So the adoption center, do they not publish? So they either don't have the fees listed or they weren't provided at the time that we requested. Okay. okay. All right, so our adoption fee, it's currently $100. Uh, $100. It, it's been waived for at least since I've been here. I've been here going on eight years. Um, low or no cost adoptions is desirable to reducing uh, crowding in the shelter. It, it's definitely, it's a plus for us when people come in and they go, oh, it doesn't cost anything to adopt. It, it makes us more desirable and it gets more traffic into the, the shelter. Uh, what we're proposing going to is a, a tiered structure and to touch again on what Chief Stewart said, it, it's based on how much we have to put into the animal. So an animal that is sterilized and vaccinated, we would charge $100 for the adoption. An animal that is sterilized but not vaccinated would be 80. An unsterilized but vaccinated animal would be 40. And an unsterilized, unvaccinated animal would be 20. How do you tell if they're vaccinated or not? So that would be if someone surrenders an animal and they have the medical records for it showing that it's been vaccinated. Or if we provide the vaccine when the animal was with us. If I took it over to the clinic and got it a rabies vaccine and then we place it up for adoption, now we know it's vaccinated. That's a cost we put into it. Uh, just for reference, in 2020, we had 86 animal adoptions. And in 2021, we had 67 animal adoptions. I have a question. Okay. Were any of those repeats the same animal <clears throat> adoptions? Because uh, I mean, 2020's COVID year, right? Correct. So I'm um, sure. Well, these are spikes. These are spike. These are fiscal years. These aren't calendar years. Um, we do get some adoption returns occasionally. I can get you that specific information if you'd like Just it. Just curious if it happens. Very rarely. It'd be a handful. So why have we waived fees for eight years? As an attempt to get people to come in, it, it makes us more desirable. 
But if we're waiving, what do you think adding fees is going to do? I mean, is that going to? Well, that kind of goes back. Um, actually, your question on Flower Mound, they have no fee for adoptions. It's no cost. They just want to move it. Yeah. But the one provision on the ordinance update we're going to ask for is the ability for the city manager to authorize any of those fees to be waived um, to help us to be competitive and uh, especially in the adoption category. So uh, even though we'll have a set fee, it may be that we continue to waive it just like we have been doing for the past eight years. I mean, we pay for sterilization, right? Correct. So, yeah, I mean, I really think we need to at least cover cover our costs. What are the costs you have associated with this? Other than if it's unsterilized and uh, unvaccinated, other than those two costs, what are the costs you have? It would just be the housing and the materials to keep the animal, as well as time <clears throat> placed into caring for the animals. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Paying a fee is a heck of a lot cheaper than going to PetSmart and adopting a pet from PetSmart or any other adoption agency. So I agree with John. I think there should be at least some fee to go for a call. <clears throat> Any other questions? Our impound fee currently uh, applies to all animals impounded at the city animal shelter. It's your third. Uh, what's currently there is thirty dollars for your first impound, and then every time an animal is in, impounded, so, uh, after that, it's an additional ten dollars. So if I pick your dog up three times, it's fifty dollars for the impound. If I pick your dog up once, it's thirty. What we're proposing to go to is a twenty-five dollar impound fee with no subsequent increase. There's no additional cost for me to go out and pick a dog up five, six, seven times. It, it, so you're going to charge $25 every time? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Every time an animal is impounded, $25. Do you still require shipping? Like if the owner comes back? It's not required, but it is all. <clears throat> we can't force someone to, to microchip their animal. Uh, for information, uh, 2020, we had 128 impounds. And in 2021, we had 83 impounds. Okay, well, to to make that a more understandable, the frequent flyers down below would have been a good number to add. You know, how many of those inbounds were reoccurring multiples? Yeah. I would say I can get you that information. Okay. I mean, because if it's done, then that's fine. But if we have <coughs> serial offenders, well, again, this is this is meant to be a fee, not a fine. I, I understand. I understand. But I mean. <clears throat> Maybe if you have if the same person's dog keeps getting out, maybe it should be a fine and not just a fee. And that, that is an option. I do have the authority to issue citations. And I mean, I get there's accidents, fence blow over, but I mean, if you know, if somebody, if you caught the same dog five times, there's a problem somewhere. <coughs> well, and also you catch a dog who doesn't have a collar on. So dogs are supposed to be leashed or collared with the, with the tags. Um, I was guilty of that five years ago, so I, I know the game. Our dog did not have on a collar, did not have tags. <clears throat> and so uh, we were told before we could take our dog back, we had to have it chipped. That's why I asked about the chip. So I agree there should be a fine. Any other questions? Uh, daily boarding fee. This applies to all privately owned animals <clears throat> impounded at the city shelter. Uh, currently, it's eleven fifty a day. Um, to your question earlier, it's, you know, kennel service time, food, water, litter supplies, you know, the staff's time. That's the other fee associated with that. And boarding is charged starting after the day of impound. So if I pick it up today, it's $25. Starting tomorrow, you're, you're charged boarding going forward per day. Uh, what we're proposing is a $15 a day uh, fee. We can see that most local private boarding facilities charge anywhere from $36 to $52 a day. Um, our other areas that we compared on that chart range between five and fifteen dollars a day for boarding. I recommend you go to at least what medical animal medical center charges. <laughs> no, I mean seriously, keep, if, if people, there's got to be an incentive to come and get the dog too. Okay. The dog is in, so don't don't make it. You know, for fifteen bucks a day, I'll turn the dog loose and I'll come and get it after vacation. <laughs> it's gonna be a little expensive when I start writing tickets for it. Though. No, no, but I'm, I'm just saying. You know, don't don't make it. We don't want to be punity, but the other side of it is is. is I mean, do you have people? Is this a real problem? I mean, I mean, is this a serious problem? As far as you're having to board board dogs, 
I would say the, the vast majority of people pick up their animal within a day or two. It's only that it's usually no, hey, we were on vacation and the pet sitter let the dog out is why it takes four or five days to, to claim an animal. Because if an animal is not doesn't have ID on it, we only hold them for three days before we place them up for adoption. <clears throat> There's a pretty short window there. Uh, deceased animal removal disposal. Um, currently, it's fifteen dollars. Uh, this is charged for animals removed from private property. Domestic animals are cremated at an area facility. Um, what we're proposing is seventy-five dollars for a domestic animal. That is what this company charges us to dispose of the animals. This will just cover our cost, and then twenty-five dollars for wildlife. So I got a I got a question about the wildlife part of it. So if if and I and this actually happened, we had we have a, like an arbor thing on the back end of our pool. A possum crawled up in there and, and just died. I'm not going to reach up there and try to pull that dead possum out. So if a, a varmint like that, if you're willing to pay the $25 fee, we'll come out and remove it. Otherwise, it's private property. It's responsibility of the property owner building the city ordinance. So what do people normally do if they do it themselves? Where do they put in the trash? And <laughs> It's, it's honestly, it's no different than if you threw a steak or a chicken away. It's just a steak or chicken with fur on it. goes to landfill. I guess that's one way to look at it. You know, some people are concerned about smell and they don't want that, and they're willing to pay the $25 and we'll come out. But that $25 covers my cost to get it, to store it, and then take it to a facility to be destroyed. Put it on the curb and let bolts Oh, John. <laughs> 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 I'm sick. <laughs> they worked on the field balls. <laughs> Quickly. Yeah. All right, our euthanasia fees. Excuse me. If, oh, wow. my, if my dog dies, can I throw him in the trash too? Yeah. Sure. Yes, you can. Really big chicken. <laughs> just a furry steak. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious. I'm sure there's people who do. So, euthanasia. Uh, currently, <laughs> there's no listed fee for that. However, a surrender fee and a deceased animal removal fee were charged if that was to happen. Uh, animal ownership must be surrendered to the city before we can euthanize an animal. Uh, ordinance requires private means not be readily available, such as an emergency field situation. So basically what that means is the way ordinance is written is you can't call me up and go, hey, my dog is old, it's time to be put down. That's not a service that we provide. When people call me and ask me that, it's, sorry, we don't provide that service, you need to contact a veterinarian. But this is, what this covers is our right. act. Something crazy, something where those private means aren't readily available, the animal is suffering and dying, it needs to be euthanized. They surrender it, we, have, we need a fee for that, and we can take care of it. Um, proposed would be no change. Proposed is actually surrender fee plus deceased animal disposal fee, and that is on the, the chart. And you charge, I mean, does uh, Animal Medical Center, do they do the euthanasia for us? No, I am a certified euthanasia technician. I provide euthanasia services for the city. Can I give you a name of some people? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just for the animals. I'm sorry. I have a list. <laughs> You're on a hot mic now. <laughs> it's okay. I got 35 days. <laughs> <laughs> the excess animal permit, um, currently it's $50 per permit, and that's annually. Uh, requires uh, required for up to eight or more domestic animals. A property inspection is done by myself before the permit is issued to check for uh, health and safety factors. Uh, we don't currently have any permits issued, and I've only ever issued one in eight years. So we're not proposing a change to this fee. Is that to say there's just nobody in the city that has more than eight animals right now? So the old ordinance was four cats or four dogs. And the previous person that had it had five dogs, so they required. With the new ordinance, it just says eight domestic animals. So I would say, uh, I don't know. Either people don't know, or I'm just not finding out if they have more than what's required. So I said I've only ever done one. Uh, exotic animal registration. Uh, $50 <clears throat> registration annually. It's going to be very similar to the excess animal permit. It requires me to go out and do an inspection. Make sure everything is is what it needs to be. Health and safety factors. Um, I've never issued one of these. Never had anyone call me and say I need an exotic animal permit. I was just going to ask. Exotic is uh, chickens, for example. Are they considered domesticated? They're considered fowl. They're under the I, livestock category. Okay. okay. 
So again, no proposed changes. What would exotic be, snake? So our current ordinance, the way it's defined, basically if it's not defined as domestic, uh, fowl, livestock, exotic's kind of the catch-all category. Okay. okay. Dangerous dog registration. Currently, there was no fee listed um, required when a dog is deemed dangerous by the Dangerous Dog Advisory Board. Uh, a da the dangerous dog definition, just to go over that, is a dog that makes an unprovoked attack on a person causing bodily injury in a place other than the dog's enclosure, or makes, an unpro uh, makes unprovoked acts in a place other than the dog's enclosure causing a reasonable belief the dog will attack or cause bodily injury to a person. Uh, they have to provide $100,000 of liability insurance on their homeowner statement to have a dangerous dog, and it has to be specifically for that animal. Uh, proper security enclosure, fencing, and signage as defined by ordinance, and this requires an inspection by me to go out before a permit is issued to make sure they are in compliance with state law and city ordinance. A uh, special collar and registration tag have to be issued. What we're proposing is $100 for that fee. There's a lot of effort that has to go into this. We will purchase and provide the signage, the collars, my time to go out and do the inspection. $100 is not unreasonable. And this will be done annually, just like any other permit. How many are currently in place right now? Zero. We've only ever had one. What is a dangerous dog? So a, a dangerous dog, like on the previous slide, is a, a dog that makes an unprovoked attack on a person that causes bodily injury or would lead a reasonable person to believe that a dog would cause an attack that would cause bodily injury. And we have a dangerous dog advisory board. If a person makes a complaint or, or something happens that rises to that level, it goes before the board and the board makes a decision on whether to deem the animal dangerous or not. So it doesn't go to breed particularly. No. It's just that's what I was going to ask. So, so Texas has a law in the book that prohibits any municipalities from making breed specific laws. We actually met on dangerous dog, what, six months ago? Yes. And that dog got transferred out of the city instead of going to all these regulations. We, yes, we were going to deem it dangerous. It actually, it actually left the country. So somebody else's problem at that point. Yes. So who is the dangerous dog advisory board? So the dangerous dog advisory board is double duty with the animal advisory boards. The same people who sit on the advisory board sit on the dangerous dog board. I'm also a watchdog. Speaking of dangerous dogs, and then there's that euthanasia. Crap yeah. <laughs> permit fee. You remember it. Currently, there is no permit fee listed. Uh, permits are good for 90 days. Mm -hmm. uh, all place traps, whether city or privately owned, must have a valid trap to be placed. Uh, have a, excuse me, must have a valid trap permit displayed. Private wildlife control services estimate between $212 and $274. <coughs> this was from Home Advisor for our zip code. That's typically the cost for a private company to come out and do what we provide. Um, this is my single largest call load every year. This is what I spend the majority of my time doing is trap calls and handling wildlife. Uh, what we're proposing is a hundred dollar permit fee. That permit is good for 90 days. Um, you can see down there in 2020, I had 349 trap calls, and in 2021, I had 200. So if I call you to come out and trap the feral cats in my neighborhood, you're going to charge me a fee. We, you would have to get a permit, it'd be good for 90 days, and it would cost you a hundred dollars. Who provides the trap? So we have traps that we will loan out, or if you go to Lowe's and purchase a trap for us to come out and service your trap, you need a permit. Or if I got a raccoon in the back of my yard, right? He keeps coming around. I'm gonna have to pay a hundred bucks for a permit fee. Yes, sir. I disagree. What about totally. moles? You guys handle moles? <laughs> so any of your, your pests your and rodents like that? Squirrels, moles, moles, rats, mice. That's a pest nice. control company issue. What's the most unique animal you've had to take out of a trap? Out of a trap? Yeah. <clears throat> Small child. Was it? No way. Wasn't intentional that it was in there. <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was a big dog trap that the kid crawled in. Mom didn't know how to open it. Through <laughs> <laughs> chicken. Because I live, my house backs up to a railroad, mm -hmm. and there's a green area behind my railroad, my house between my fence and my the railroad, and I get critters in there all the time. Now most of the time I can chase them off. But I've had a trap laid out. I've had a couple traps laid out over the years. 
to catch invasive raccoons that come in and gnaw on my trash or my neighbor's trash. Well, guess what? It's not my fault. It's not my raccoon. I didn't feed the raccoon. The raccoon lives there. So why am I paying him? Or I got feral cats. That, by the way, you still haven't taken care of in my neighborhood that run all around my neighborhood. Tonight, came tonight. <laughs> and those aren't my feral cats. But guess what? They come and poop in my bushes. They stir up my dog. They go to the bathroom in areas and I chase them out. Well, guess what? He's going to charge me a hundred bucks to come out and catch the feral cats. So I don't think that I should have to pay a hundred bucks to have a permit to come out and catch something that I didn't cause or create. And, that's why and I don't think my neighbor should either. To discuss this. I'm just, I'm just get a pellet gun and then pellet gun. If, if, if you'll let me use my 38, I'll kill them. Use it or not. But then I'm in violation of city ordinances because I fired my gun in the city. I'll get arrested. And that's his all place trap, city or privately owned. Correct. So if he went to a Home Depot and bought a trap and put it in his backyard and hauled off the raccoon himself, he'd be committing a violation of state law. But by the way, I don't want to touch the trap to said <laughs> raccoon because well, that raccoon say, can bite through the through the trap. That's why he's here. I'm going state to get, to get paid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's a state law. Yes, you private citizens cannot transport high risk animals or wildlife in general. It's a Class C uh, Parks and Wildlife misdemeanor. Only if you get caught. Yeah. What'd you say? Yeah. Only if you get caught. It's true. <laughs> I mean, they, they walk across my front porch. I've got raccoons. Yeah. Uh, fox. I've got a fox. I've got a skunk. Last two weeks. Yeah, most yeah. wildlife. I don't want my ring doorbell. Yeah. Yes, every night possible. I've got I've got a skunk that lives in my bushes. That I'm telling you. He's home. Yeah, it's his home. I'm not going out there to chase like a skunk. Cats. Okay, I will, but I'll get arrested. I'll bail you out. I, I think you. this is going to require more discussion. Okay. Because we're all learning something, so we're... we're well, that, that's that's the purpose of this, is to... Yeah, no, I mean, this is... Yeah, exactly. All right, owner release fees. Lots of critters in the city. Currently, the owner release fee is $50 per animal or $50 per litter. And a litter of animals is, you know, much kittens, much puppies, as long as they're under eight weeks old. If they're older than eight weeks old, we charge per animal. Uh, this is if an owner no longer wants an animal and surrenders for adoption or euthanasia. So our proposed is it's going to be tiered much like our adoption. So if the animal is unsterilized and unvaccinated, we're going to charge them $100 because it's more work we have to put into them to get them up to that standard. If they're unsterilized but vaccinated, we'll charge 90 if they're sterilized but unvaccinated, we'll charge 60. But if they're sterilized and vaccinated, we'll charge 50, which is what we were previously charged. Okay, I gotta ask this. So <coughs> if somebody turns over their, you know, turns over Ruffy to and you you know, want you to euthanize Ruffy for whatever reason, you're gonna give Ruffy a vaccination first before no. you kill him. So this is this is for surrenders. This is what information the citizens provide. If they can prove to me that their animal is sterilized and vaccinated, okay. I charge them 50. Okay. If they don't have any of that documentation, I'm going to have to do it, charge them 100. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, 2020, we had 31 owner releases, and in 2021, we have 14. Okay. So we have this fee schedule depending on how you surrender the animal, and we have this kind of an opposite fee schedule and tiered upside down for when you get the animal. <clears throat> but if you're if you're sterilizing and vaccinating all these animals, then what do we have the tier structure on the adoption? Because it's still money we have to put into it. This is not going to cover our total costs to surrender in. It's going to be some up front from the surrender and it's the rest of the costs at the okay, adoption. Okay, so I misunderstood then. So anytime you adopt an animal from our shelter, Correct. it's going to be sterilized and vaccinated regardless. Yes, assuming it's spent enough time in the shelter. You know, if I get a, a Yorkie in, super desirable, I have people lining up, you know, the day it's available. I hold it for my three days. No one comes forward to claim it. Someone comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning on the day it's available. I didn't have a chance to do that. So as long as the animal's in our custody long enough and I can get them on the schedule, yes. So, so that's where you get the lower fee because it's not vaccinated. 
person no, verifiable. No, no, I'm saying the other way around for the adoption. Yes, yeah, so if we didn't have time to do that, we're not going to okay. charge them for a service right. we didn't provide. All right. I just, so what happens if I come in on the fourth day to claim my Yorkie and you gave him, given him to mine? I'll tell you, you're out of luck. Too bad. And that's how it chipped. My Yorkie is chipped. <laughs> your Yorkie's got nothing to worry about. So, so if they're chipped, you contact the owners. Yes, and three days is only for animals that don't have identification. If they're wearing a collar or they're microchipped, we give you seven days. I took all action. You guys were mean to my Yorkie. Oh, geez. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Rabies quarantine at the shelter. Currently, that is $17.50 per day. Uh, there is a maximum of 10 days of quarantine that are required by law. That's 10 days from the day of the bite. So if I'm not told until two or three days later, it could be eight days of quarantine, seven days of quarantine. It's 10 at the max. Uh, quarantines are required for bites and scratches to humans. Home quarantine is allowed if an animal is not stray, is currently vaccinated against rabies, or is less than four months old. And that less from four months old is the vaccination. So the state says once your animal is four months old, they must be vaccinated. So if your animal is less than four, you're not required to have a vaccine. We can't take that into consideration for home quarantine. All other animals require shelter, uh, all other animals require shelter or vet quarantine. Okay, so if, if a home quarantine isn't allowed, they have to come to our facility or another licensed quarantine facility. That could be a veterinarian. Uh, animals must be monitored twice daily for symptoms. So that's time and effort that we have to put into, plus I'm the only one who's allowed to handle them. So it's a little more of my time instead of the clinic staff. Um, what we're proposing to going to will be $20 a day. It's a, a little bit up from what we're currently have, but again, this covers a little extra effort you have to go into taking care of a quarantine dog as opposed to a boarding animal. 2020, we had seven, seven quarantines at the shelter, and 2021, we had three quarantines at the shelter. Uh, rabies specimen testing. Currently, it's $50 per animal. Uh, done for an animal that dies under quarantine or becomes ill. If ill, the animal is humanely euthanized. Uh, carcass requires special pep preparation, packaging, and shipping to a lab in Austin for testing. Uh, specimen is submitted to Texas Department of State Health Services, a certified laboratory for rabies diagnosis. Um, we're not proposing a change to that fee because $50 pretty much covers our <coughs> for that. Uh, rabies vaccine. Uh, currently, it's ten dollars an animal. Only a veterinarian is legally licensed. Uh, a licensed veterinarian is the only person legally allowed to administer a rabies vaccine. I cannot, so a vet has to be involved. Uh, what we're proposing is just the actual cost, because rates change. Vaccines cost different things, so just actual cost. Bordetella vaccine and a flea treatment. Currently, it's five dollars for a Bordetella vaccine. $10 for a flea treatment, just like the rabies vaccine, we're suggesting actual cost. Do <coughs> you provide any documentation to the, to the customer of what the actual cost is? Yes, because we'll, we'll get a bill for it. We'll, those services will be provided by the clinic. We'll be billed for them, and then we'll get through that. This is what we were billed. This is what you owe us. So you won't know until they get the bill, right? Well, when we take an animal over to be serviced by the vet, you know, when we walk out, they're going to give us a receipt for the services. So this is just an animal. Let's say I impound a dog off the street and it's just covered in fleas and ticks. I can't take that into the shelter and risk spreading it. I'm going to walk it over and get it a treatment. I'll have a bill for that. When they come in the next day to pick it up, I'm going to say, here's your impound, here's your boarding, and oh, we had to give them a flea treatment. Uh, veterinary bills, same thing. Uh, currently, it's actual cost. We're not, we're not recommending any changes to that. Uh, treatment typically at Animal Medical Center of Highland Village unless it's an emergency. And what we mean by veterinary bills is if an animal comes in with an injury or a wound or something like that, we have to care for the animal to prevent unjustifiable pain and suffering until that a, someone either comes to claim it or that animal becomes ours and then we can take further steps. But again, you know, you come in, your dog's got a gash on its neck, you come in two days later, we have to stitch it up, you're going to get a bill for that. And I will turn it back over to you, Stuart. Yeah, go ahead and stay there, Wes, because I want you to cover the update number two. Okay. But uh, on this first one here, uh, so we talked about all the fees now. So now we're going to go into the ordinance updates that we discuss. 
So the first ordinance update is to uh, amend that section of the ordinance to allow a fee waiver authorization by the city manager or designee to reduce, refund, or waive fees, similar to what is in the uh, city parks waiver authorization section of the current city ordinance. If you would go ahead and go to the next page. So this is what the update would look like. It would change this section here to say the city manager or designee is authorized to reduce, refund, or waive any fees under this chapter when such action is necessary or even in the best interest of the city of Holland Village. So that way, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about if uh, all of our surrounding cities are waiving their adoption. I don't know if you saw in Louisville, they have a, a big board, um, electronic bulletin board in Louisville saying that the animal shelters on sale and free adoptions. Um, for us to um, you know, help move our animals quickly rather than keep them in the kennel forever, it really does help us sometimes to have <coughs> low or no cost adoptions. Uh, this ordinance would allow the city manager to, or his designee to make that decision whether a fee should be waived during a certain period of time or whatever. That way we wouldn't have to go back to council each time to pass a resolution to make that change. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Okay. But this one's kind of technical, so I'm going to let Wes do this. All right. So we changed our <coughs> chicken ordinances <coughs> back in September. Uh, going through them again, some language needed to be changed. So we wanted to update section 4.05.005 keeping of chickens and roosters, we want to change it to keeping a fowl. So fowl is a, a legal term. It's defined, and it defines five or six species of animal, uh, of birds specifically. We want, so ducks, someone's keeping ducks. We don't want them to look at this and go, well, this only applies to chickens and roosters. It applies to fowl. Duck is a fowl. You have to, you fall within this category. Uh, change all references from bird to fowl. So as you can see, a little lower down, it, it said birds. We want to change that to fowl. Birds is all-encompassing. That's bald eagles. That's ostriches. We don't want that. We're talking about fowl. So any reference to bird, we want to change to fowl. As a continuation, so... Number two, all fowl must be contained in a coop, cage, or pen at all times located not less than 50 feet from an adjacent residential structure. What we propose to add is unless prior permission is granted in writing by the affected adjacent property owner. So you could have two property owners that don't mind a coop being built right up against a fence line if it's closer than 50. If the person wants to build it there and can get permission from their neighbor to have it built, we should have an exception there to allow them to do that. Question so, on that. Sorry, interrupt. What happens when the neighbors sell their house and somebody new moves in? Do they have to go get that permission again? Correct. Or risk losing their yes. coop? Yes, and, and we will provide you. This is rough draft. We'll provide you a, a later time, but we have language in there for what happens when a person moves out or abandons a the property. There's a whole process they need to go through again. And obviously, depending on uh, how we want to approach it, that will require uh, Mr. Grafita to make sure we have the proper wording in there, the legal language, to make sure it's done right. We're just kind of talking in generalities here on the language. We know it's probably not anywhere near what it needs to be, but uh, it's a starting point. And then second question for me, it says not located not less than 50 feet from an adjacent residential structure. Is that your own structure? Or is that your neighbor's? An adjacent no. residential structure. So that would be outside of their property line. Well, I didn't know if the coop was the residential structure and the house that you live in is the adjacent residential. No. Okay. So it could be 50 feet from your own place? It could be right up against your, okay. your own walls. It's just you your neighbor's. Yeah. yeah. And then three and four, those are just, you know, again, striking birds and putting fowl in. I'm sorry, can you go back real quick? I keep seeing one acre and then I see 10,000 square feet. So can you just explain the difference quickly on what you can keep on an acre versus okay. what I can keep on 10,000 square feet? 
So uh, anyone who has at least 10,000 square feet may have between two and 20 birds. You have an acre, you're allowed many as you want with an excess permit. So, and then any residents under 10,000 is allowed up to two. Thank you. <laughs> but no roosters under an acre. Correct. No roosters. And only, only have one. One rooster. Even if you've got 50 acres, one rooster. Yeah, lucky guy. You can still hear him. So, <laughs> this larger section here is just, to your question, an expansion on. So unless prior permission is granted in writing by the affected adjacent property owner, the affected adjacent property owners may rescind permission, uh, rescind permission by providing 30 day written notice after which uh, the foul permit will expire. Uh, foul permits will expire 30 days after change in ownership of an affected adjacent property owner. So again, this is kind of rough draft. This is not the final language. This is just to convey an idea. This kind of wraps it up here to summarize uh, what we presented. We're recommending the city master fee schedule be updated to include the animal service fees. And the ordinance update number one be approved to allow the city manager or designee to reduce, refund, or waive any uh, animal service fees if it's deemed in the best interest of the city. And then uh, the ordinance update number two we're recommending changing the um, chicken and roosters to fowl. And uh, allow for the effective neighbor permission exception. Mark, would there be a corresponding definition to fowl? So we know it's chickens, ducks. Yes, the fowl is already defined in the definition section okay. of the ordinance. Right. So I think, um, okay, John. Question. How is money transacted? Do you have in your office over there ability to take a credit card, debit card? Yes, I, I can take a credit card. Okay. Or a debit card. We don't do cash or check. If they want to do that, I give an invoice and send them down to City Hall to make a payment. Okay. And it's all, all done with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go anywhere else than the mall. Mm -hmm. You take payments out of the shelter. Well, thank what you. is the kennel capacity? And if it ever overloads, do y'all have a, a agreement with a local like Louisville or another service that takes over? Uh, our kennel capacity we have 10 dog kennels and 14 cat kennels. Never been over capacity. Okay. So I think based on just discussion earlier that there might need to be more discussion. I think updating the the language, if you go back to that last slide, that, that bottom half, the, the ordinance language, um, and or both of those, but I think the master uh, fee schedule council, it kind of sounded like council wanted more, a little more discussion, maybe. Well, it's not on the on the action agenda, so no. we've got an opportunity there. Right. So they just, I think, maybe just furnish them some more um, information. Um, you guys jump in there. What are, what are you looking for? Well, the, the only, after hearing what his costs are, I kind of pulled back on my thoughts on the adoption fee. I think you're you're covering your cost and you're, and you're getting back to what, let's say, market should be. The only one that I hold true on is paying $100 for the permit to have them come in the trap. That's my big one. And the reason for that is because of state law, the, the permit fee for the trap. Yeah, it's it's paying either, or really whether it's our trap or a private trap, you're, you're paying for my time to come, to come out and service that trap. And we know permit's good for 90 days. I mean, you call me 100 times. And it's just that one fee. You still disagree? I have a coyote that comes over to my property. We have coyotes back there. And I'm sorry, eats my dog. Okay. Well, coyotes eat. Should be eating your cats. I don't have cats. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Okay, so where I'm going with this is I don't believe that our citizens should have to pay a fee for them putting traps out there. I can, I can I can see some I can see some blowback on that. So at the very least, there needs to be definitely some messaging. Yeah, absolutely. So but I I think what I'm understanding is you'll bring the trap out, but you're not going to set the trap up and bait the trap, and but you're just going to bring it to the res to the residents, and you're going to, and then for 90 days, um, and then when since something is trapped, you're going to come pick it up and dispose of yes, and, that and bring the trap back. And what your what the permit fee is for is not necessarily again for me bringing you the trap because you can go get your own trap. Right. What the fee is for is for my time, however many times you call me out. To come handle that situation. Totally and how often does that happen? 
it's again the number one most number thing one that thing. I do. And what is the what do you trap most? Uh, it's a variety of wildlife. So you've got you know raccoons, you've got possums, armadillos, squirrels. You know, uh, feral cats is a big one. We started TNR, so I'm, I'm starting to trap a lot of those now. But it just depends. Where you take them? What about skunks? Skunks we no longer do. So that was passed by city ordinance. That's a pest issue. It's a private person's we responsibility. We didn't create the problem. Our so citizens did not create the problem. So Tom, what's the solution? What's the alternative? We pay him to do his job. <laughs> I guess that's where my question comes. Is I keep hearing it's paying for my time to come out, but. He's a part of the budget already well, as an operating expense. I understand salary. that, but that's the same argument I would have with saying this, paying the city for a permit and plan review, right? I have to pay for plan review to get a permit from the city. Well, we're already paying them to well, that's, work that's at the city. So totally, why is that different? Though? All right, it's totally different because you're, plan, you're paying for a plan review to do something to your structure, to your house. That is you're a conscious decision that you will you're Me. calling for a trap to be placed out there. Then but I didn't create the animal. I didn't, I didn't create, create the raccoon coming in. Okay, to, to, to Robert's point, though, he didn't plan for his water heater to blow up, but you still got to get a permit for somebody to come replace it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's plenty of things we have to pay fees for that I think should be, you know, pro bono by the city, but that's not how it works. So. We can agree to disagree. Well, let me better. give you a perspective on fee versus cost. The, uh, the average roughly $1,700 a year in feeds collected. Our line item for the animal care is average is between 50 and 55. It does not include less salary, does not include overhead, does not include that new animal con control vehicle we just purchased. Um, so there's quite a difference. I mean, we, we don't really expect it to be cost recovery. But again, that's a perspective that, that we do have some real costs. Ken, I know where you can find a million dollars that's going out the door for no service whatsoever. <clears throat> so, stay on, stay on topic. I, I'm, I'm adamant about it. So, so yeah, I only fine. have one vote. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so, what, would it try. make a difference on the trap fee if there's a fee only charged if it's our trap rather than the resident's trap? Well, let me ask a question. So, if he has to come out and pick up an animal, do they also get charged the deceased animal removal? Yeah, it's separate, right? Yeah, yeah, which I have an issue with. So, well, I mean, so if it's a personal trap, but we're asking the city to come and pick it up, we would be subject to um, the fact that it's in a trap that the private owner bought themselves. I would see a problem with charging a fee for that. But if it's a city provided trap and the city is disposing of the dead animal, then, I mean, there should be a fee for that. Well, what I have trouble is the scenario I laid out. You know, a possum comes and jumps in my saltwater pool and drowns. I didn't invite him to come swim in my pool. Well, so I can just... Get it out, put it in a bag and put it in your trash. Right. That's 25 bucks. Wouldn't you rather just pay somebody 25 bucks to get rid of that for you? Then... No. Well, in the analogy, the analogy I'll is that for our citizens, you know, it gets cold outside and you have a, a, a sprinkler line that freezes and busts. Are you going to call the water department to come out and fix that? Yes, it's not a situation that you create. It's <laughs> over the blind. <laughs> no, but we just no, I get around. Let's table this. Well, and where I'm going is, is I'm not used to come into my yard. I'm not saying that. Uh, I guess where I'm coming in from is, is we're going to get questions. And so we need to be able to answer the questions in a way that's going to both educate voters and convince them this is the right thing to do. Can you show the comp again for what other cities are charging for that fee? Yes. For traps? Yes. Um, Trap permit. So Louisville has a $50 deposit and there's no fees listed for any other city. So when you remove a live animal, Yellow, possum, whatever. What do you do with it? Does it go? <laughs> so based on where it's taken, the city is taken far enough away oh, that, that it won't come back to that residence and won't interfere with it. <laughs> like if I were to pick something up here, like at the city hall, it probably looks like it's around the park. Okay. Okay. No, I'd, I'd like to recommend that we table this. Okay. Because right now we're talking about state law. Yeah. Right, yes. 
and how we want to administer, because if I set a trap, state's going to come and arrest me. I think we need to table that section. We can we meet it table it's not an action item? It's not, I mean, it's just up for discussion. I think it needs to be brought back in the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bring back. I like everything discussion. that I've seen. And can you make that after maybe? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you for the next <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I'd love to spend Perfect. more time just on this piece of this state is, law because uh, we get a lot of critters. Mm -hmm. You spend a lot of time. Let's understand that before we. So obviously, this has been very educational yeah. for the council yeah. as well because we didn't have the idea that all of this was going on. So yeah, if you uh, if you could bring it back for questions as well. I mean, Action we can change our firearm ordinance. Simplify it. Yeah. Oh, shoot the critter in the okay, let's move on. <laughs> Bumps less than 350. Uh, <laughs> we can have the West. Also, I would like to just, uh, appreciate West getting the presentation yes. here. In case y'all didn't know it, this week is actually um, uh, the National Animal Control Association is designated as the uh, Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week, oh, wow. which happens to coincide the same week as the National Telecommunicators. Yes. Appreciation Week, which is the dispatch. We kind of got a double appreciation week this week. For so, so what color stripes in the animal control flag? You know, it's it's funny. <laughs> I just saw a discussion. We got blue, we got purple. We got Nobody could make, can make up their mind. <laughs> so I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> well, we Wes, thank you so you much. We, we really do. I'd like to say a quick thank you to Wes. Um, in the past, by him putting up animals for adoption on the website, my brother, who lives in Midland, whose wife had just lost her Yorkie, saw a hairless or long hair yes. chihuahua <laughs> that had been turned over. My brother calls me. I go get the pet. Has a happy home still to today. That's so a straw thank man you. purchase, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do the same for Tom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ray, can I borrow? Yes, thank you so much. Good presentation, very educational, and um, and we appreciate you. Thank you. All you do. So, okay, we're ready to move on. Clarification of consent or action items on the agenda. Does anybody have any questions for the presentation? No. Very lengthy. Yes. No. No questions on this very lengthy. Okay. Are we? Okay. No? All right. Well, then we are adjourned. We'll meet up at seven in the council chamber.
a call to order April 12th, <laughs> and time is 7.05. Perfect, thank you, Mayor Bella. So tonight we have Mayor for the Day, Bella Orana, and we'll do the, pre the uh, proclamation in a little bit, but um, she is a fifth grader at Heritage Elementary, and you have been on a tour with uh, the fire department and the police department. Did you learn anything? Uh, yes. They didn't ask to raise it, did they? No. Okay, good, good. Okay. <laughs> I think they've learned their lessons, so. All right, so we are gonna get started with a prayer and the pledges led by Councilman Heslip. So, come. Just bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight I pray for love, thanks, forgiveness for all of our folks here who live in the city, all of our uh, public servants, our uh, men and women in the armed forces serving around the world. I pray for forgiveness for those atrocities that have been going on in the Ukraine. I pray and I give thanks for all the great things that we have going on in our home state, our city, and in our country. Lord, please bless us all, keep us all from harm, help us do the best that we can do in every walk of our lives and truly make a difference in the world. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. thank you. Please stand for the pledges. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. For all. Honor the Texas, Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Tom. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Mayor, our next thing is uh, visitor comments. Uh, anyone wishing to address the City Council must complete a speaker's request form and read it uh, and turn it into the City Secretary. Do we have any... No one signed up. Okay, so, um, Council, I would just like to uh, go on the record. We did receive a an email. We all have copies of that uh, from Mr. Eric Britton, and his address is 123 Scenic, um, and he did send in an email. Um, is this, did he just, does he want me to read this? He wants the, the email read, okay. Good evening, council members. My name is Eric Britton. I live at 123 Scenic Drive. I am fortunately out of town on business. I am fortunately out of town on business. <laughs> However, I would like to inform the council of a situation me and my neighbors are currently facing. Our section of Clearwater States is currently having our roads replaced. Along the normal replacement, along the normal replacement, there have been several improvements, specifically including a new curb at the top of Scenic Drive from approximately at 115 Scenic to 117 Scenic. Along the new curb is a new curb inlet for drainage. All this water has been directed down the hill affecting every house on the block. While we in, have individually brought up our concerns individually, it wasn't until the storm last week that we could see the resulting damage from the design. While we are all intelligent people and understand the construction was complete, my neighbors who have lived in the neighborhood saw more water than they had in 20 plus years. Further to the point, several inches of topsoil was eroded from multiple properties. Fences knocked over, a railroad retaining wall at my house was knocked over into pieces, and Van Weaver's house was partially flooded. Because of our concerns, we had a meeting with city, count, city staff on Friday both at City Hall in the morning and then properties in the afternoon. Staff noted the damage and agreed to have it, the engineer of record come to review the drainage. My neighbors and I further notified them that the 28 inch drainage pipe that has been run into 121 Scenic is not within a pro proper easement and that we need to discuss potential options with the city. I followed up with an email requesting that all construction stops until the engineer was able to access. In what I feel was an action of extreme bad faith said city staff showed up on site Monday morning with 20 construction workers and two tractors to attempt to complete the drainage ditch on 121 Scenic. In response, 
I contacted city manager to help resolve the issue without further escalating tensions between staff and the neighborhood. Paul stopped construction yesterday, but sent an email this morning <coughs> stating at this time the city has concluded the construction of the road and drainage infrastructure will not cease. The city will, however, direct the contractor to plug the new drainage infrastructure installed as part of the project, essentially bringing the drainage back to pre-construction drainage conditions. The construction has began again on our street. The pipe cannot be the pipe cannot be simply dammed up as all of the new design has incorporated that drainage. Second, the city is allowing the contractor to complete non-engineered construction on our street. Third, not only they are not, third, not only are they not allowing it, but they are directing it. This places an incredible amount of liability on the city. I thought as representatives of our city, you should be aware of what is going on, and I thank you for your time. Best regards, Eric Britton. So, all right, thank you so much. Um, okay, so we are going to, um, we're going to move on and uh, with mayor and council reports on items of community interest. Council, may have anything? Yes, Barbara. I'd like to thank hmm. the HBBA Business Association for the wonderful luncheon that they had today. And our speaker was our new superintendent, Lori Rapp. She is very involved. Uh, I liked the lady before. I heard her speak, but now I know that our school's in the hands of a great person. So thank you, HVBA. Anybody else? So I would like to recognize our, uh, our dispatchers because it is uh, National Dispatch uh, Public, uh, Telecommunicators Week and our, um, our very own animal control officer because as Chief Stewart pointed out in early work session, it is also National Animal Control Officers Week. So um, we are very, very blessed in Highland Village to have wonderful um, animal control officer and, and dispatchers. So hats off to them. Now we get to go down here and do this. We have a proclamation for our mayor for the day. I'm gonna let you hold this. They always give me this in big letters so I can see. So, whereas the city of Highland Village is served by and is proud to support the Louisville Independent School District, and whereas the city of Highland Village recognizes that current LISD students are the future leaders of our city, county, state, and nation. <clears throat> and whereas Heritage Elementary School has provided Highland Village students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade, high quality education. And whereas the city of Highland Village offered a mayor for the day opportunity to one lucky student and Heritage Elementary, it says second, but you're fifth. Fifth grade student, Bella Orana, was the successful recipient. Now therefore I, on behalf of the city council and city staff, Charlotte Wilcox, mayor of the city of Highland Village, do hereby congratulate and recognize Bella Orana as the mayor for the day in the city of Highland Village. Congratulations, mayor. Thank you. Absolutely, you're fifth grade, right? Yes. Okay, let me see this for a second. So, would you like to say something? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you can go, oh, I, I guess we have to have pictures. So, um, and then we're gonna get that fixed. Um, so, you wanna hold this like that. We're gonna take pictures. Perfect, thank you. Y'all wanna, mom, dad, y'all wanna take, you come over here and take pictures, you can just do it across the room, it's fine. There. Thank you. All right. So if you want to say something, you can. Yeah. Now's your time. So before our meeting, or I was asking Bella if she, uh, what, what she wanted to be, we were talking about that. She wants to be president someday. Now that, I will support. All right. So you're gonna call me whenever that happens? Perfect. You're gonna start with mayor and work your way up. 
Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Yes. So, are we um, ready to move on? Okay. So now we're going to do the consent agenda. Um, do you want to read that, or do you want me to? I'll read this, it. Huh? This, this section. Go right ahead. All of the items on the consent agenda are considered for approval by a single motion and vote without discussion. Each council member has the option of removing an item from this agenda so that it may be considered separately and or adding any item from the action agenda to be considered as part of the consent agenda items. Perfect, so the consent agenda items are number 10, consider approval of minutes for the regular city council meeting held on March 22nd, 2022. Number 11, receive budget reports for period ending February 28th, 2022. Council? Do I, uh, Mr. Lombardo? I would like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda item as read. Okay, and Mr. Heslop? I will uh, make a motion. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, Council. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Carries, did you vote for it? 8 0, 7 0. <laughs> okay. We're going to move to the uh, action agenda. So we're going to we're going to skip number twelve because we didn't meet in closed session. We're going to go to number thirteen. Conduct a public hearing and consider ordinance twenty twenty two dash twelve ninety three, amending the development regulations relating to the development and use of property described as the district of Highland Village, located at the northwest corner intersection of Briar Hill Boulevard and FM four hundred seven. Mr. Kristen. Thank you, Mayor Council. The city has received an application uh, con in for consideration to amend the PD regulations for PD 2012-1 at the district, now known as Bowery Park. Um, this request is related to wall and window signage, adding an additional multi-tenant monument sign, relocation of two dumpsters, utilizing Building 7 site for additional parking until the time that Building 7 would be constructed and giving the property owner the option to finish out the live work units in building two <coughs> to residential without requiring the office space. Um, this item does require a public hearing. If we wanna do the public hearing and then we can have a discussion. Yeah, we'll do the public hearing. Okay, so, have a one-time. Public hearing is now open. Anyone that wants to speak for or against this item on the agenda, come forward. No pushing or shoving. Okay, seeing none, go ahead and hit this. Public hearing is closed. Mayor, Council, the city attorney has drafted an ordinance for, for your review. If you wanna go over the um, proposed changes, uh, you have a rather large packet uh, submitted with this. Uh, with the old ordinance and the proposed ordinance. However, I can go through it real quick. Um, the signage that request is requesting to be changed. Uh, the existing approved signage is uh, 30 inch by 12, in, uh, 12 foot signage. They're requesting to increase that to a 40 inch by 12 foot signage on, the, on uh, uh, exhibit three of your, of your packet. And they're also um, adding a, adding a sign or two here on the in the center of that building. Exhibit number five shows uh, the same thing: is 30-inch sign to increase to a 40-inch sign request on uh, on uh, exhibit five. Exhibit six, uh, three, three sign changes uh, for increasing the size and uh, revising the uh, 24 inch by five foot sign to a 30 inch by six foot sign um, on uh, exhibit number six, building two. Exhibit number seven is uh, uh, changing the uh, signage from 30 inch to 40 inch. The additional parking, uh, we're building seven, 
uh, is to be located is uh, on the uh, east side of the site, uh, fronting the Briar Hill Boulevard. Um, it's, a, it's in between the two entrances. It's a grassy area now that they would like to make parking until such time that they do build uh, building number seven. The live work units in building number two are the, um, the, bottom level, right? uh, the ground level units. Uh, he wants to uh, request making those uh, residential units and, and uh, uh, without the required office space requirement in the ordinance. Uh, monument sign proposed is um, proposed on the western side of the property, I believe. Western side of the property along the uh, 407 frontage. Just adjacent to the uh, existing Whataburger site. Uh, the two dumpster relocations are on the ingress-egress cross-access easement uh, through the center of the site on, located on the west side, uh, essentially at the entrance of the, of the uh, Bowery site. We did work this item with city uh, planning and zoning on uh, March 15th, uh, and they voted to move it forward to council. Uh, with a 3-1 vote. Um, as I said, the city attorney has drafted an ordinance for your review. I do have the uh, property owner here, um, and we'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Mr. Heslop? Yeah, at, uh, at whose request was the additional parking made? Is it the developer who's saying, hey, we need additional parking? Is it the employees? Is it the residents? I defer to Zach. Yes, sure. please. Come on up here. Face your name for the record. Right. Zach Montana. I'm at 8508 Silverleaf Circle in Lantana, Texas, um, representing the property owner of the Bowery Park. It's uh, at the request of essentially all of the above. So we've done a lot of retail leasing in those front three buildings over the last 12 months, and that's a common concern um, is that there's just going to be run out of parking. If, you, if all they have is the front of 407 and between those buildings. Um, then we also have three residential buildings that kind of surround that space too that's also a little bit short on parking. So it's already platted to be you know, a, a building. Right now it's just kind of a mowed grassy area. So we can, we can put a fair amount of parking on there for the time being and, and then come, come move forward to building seven if we decide to develop it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lombardo. Yeah, with the removal of the workspace, how many more uh, residential units are we going to have? So the, the way the ordinance currently works is you're allowed to have seven, what's defined in this ordinance as live work units. Um, the definition is it's a residential unit with the requirement of 325 square feet of either office or retail. So the, the concept would be somebody comes in, they build out an apartment in the back, and then they have their you know, boutique storefront or they have a real estate office or something in the front. So we're not looking to change the density of how many residential units we can have. Just we just want to a full residential unit with 325 more square feet. Exactly. So that way we can have more apartment units without the need of that because it's, it's kind of a unique tenant mix. And that's why that building for the last 10 years has sat there with all that shell space. Is there's, I think there's two of them that are actually built out and the rest, they just, it's just not that interesting of a concept. But so the, the actual residential density won't change. It's the same. So while, while you're there, go ahead. Yeah, don't, um, so I have a quick question about that. Are you going to fix those the fronts, the storefronts, and, and close those, make it more residential? Or are they going to stay glass and glass doors? It would stay glass with glass doors, obviously, to have privacy, but it would be just like the two that are right next door. And actually, one of the uh, members on the zoning committee is one of our residents as the real estate office up front. So it would be a very similar concept. So from, the, from Main Street, it wouldn't look any different than the others, uh, but it would allow us to pre-build them as residential units, get them finished up, and then lease them instead of sitting around waiting for you know a long-term tenant to come by that wants us to build 
an office or something up front with a unit on the back. So they're going to look just like the two that are correct. Redundant. Okay. Um, Dan. Um, so on the, I guess it's space number one ten, the, the the grassy patch. Is there still a plan to build Building Seven at some point, or is you just don't know? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, for us, n not in the near term. I think that uh, space is going to be better utilized as, as additional parking, uh, but we've only owned it for 12 months. Um, we've we've done a ton of leasing in that time, so we're kind of in the process. Let's get the build outs going. Let's get everybody open. We have a restaurant coming. We got a lot of, um, I think, exciting things happen. So the goal is let's not make parking be an issue and have our brand new businesses open up, and then all of a sudden we have big complaints on Google or wherever because nobody can park. And then if, you know, once we get settled, if the parking's not as utilized as we think it's going to be or we think we can move forward with Building 7 uh, without any issues, then we can reevaluate. Do you, where, where are your residents that have pets? <coughs> Take their pets? So we're, we actually have a walking trail that's right behind our property that takes you all, I mean, all the way over to um, what the parks are over there. I mean, the school, there's... And there's a fair amount of grass kind of intermittent between buildings, you know, between building five and six, there's a big co uh, concrete uh, sidewalk that cuts through with grass on both sides. But we don't, um, I mean, if you if you go out there very often, it's not really a heavily used piece of grass. It's, it's just a mowed spot. So I, I have another question. If this is, if this passes, are you going to let the city use and the schools use that for overflow parking and not tow cars like it have been in the past? Or is it still going to be posted as private parking your vehicle we towed? You know, we haven't evaluated that um, specifically. I can tell you the priority is probably going to be for our residents, whether it be the, or, I'm sorry, our tenants, whether it be the residential tenants or the commercial tenants. Um, you know, we've had, we've had to enforce parking every so often because people are getting parked in reserved spots and we have to do some towing. But for the most part, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we have on-site staff that's there, you know, most of them live on-site as well. So we can monitor it pretty well, um, but I don't want to commit is to there, being able to. Is your parking that, you, do you have that big of an issue with parking? Um, it's getting tighter. So when we took over, the, the residential was about 75% leased and the commercial was 60%. We're 100% full on the apartments, and we're 90% leased on the commercial. So it is, and we still have, you know, three of the six leases we've signed in the last 12 months are still in build out. So no, currently we don't have a big issue, um, but we don't want one. So it's, it's better to kind of try to preempt some of these things. Okay. Uh, Mr. Priester. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Um, on the parking again, is that... <coughs> Is that going to be pervious, impervious pavement, or is it a gravel surface? Or are you going to improve that building seven lot with concrete parking and striping? The current plan is concrete and striping. Uh, just the thought being, if you do ever want to move forward with building seven, okay. you're going to have to have you know a foundation there anyways. Um, and I don't think you know gravel or anything like that would would match the aesthetics we're going okay. for. So it would be improved. And then, can you generalize <clears throat> on the building signage itself? when certain signs are 12 feet long versus 14 feet long versus I think some of them are even 16 feet long? Yeah, so the, the length isn't necessarily changing. That's all per the court, cur, uh, current ordinance. What we're looking for is the height of the sign. Mm -hmm. It's very specific that it's capped at 30 inches. Whereas if you drive down anywhere in Highland Village, most signs are gonna be 42, 46 inches. You know, you got Salerno's right here on the corner. You got, I mean, you go look at all these signs. They're pretty tall and that's to get your attention when you drive by. Um, for some reason, our ordinance caps us at 30 inches, which has been a pretty big complaint from our uh, retail tenants because when you drive down 407, it's sometimes difficult to see. I mean, one prime example, I'm sure they hate that I use them, but be legend. So it's 30 inches. It's not the letter height, that's the height of the sign. So if you have a logo with stacked lettering like B Legend Gaming, their lettering is very tiny. So when you drive by, you can't you can barely read what their sign says. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big complaint. So that's why we're looking to increase it to 42. The length will be purely based on, you know, how it fits on the space aesthetically, how much room they have to work with or how long their logo is. But we're not looking to change that. So rather than say a set dimension for height and length, have we considered possibly a maximum square footage of each sign? 
to accommodate uh, B Legends Gaming, more a vertical stacked logo versus, I mean, it seems they're, they're at a disadvantage, right? Because their logo is portrait instead of landscape, right? But um, I didn't know if, yeah. We could, we could run down that rabbit trail and get each individual site and their own individual signage, but uh, you know, then it would be tied forever to that. Yeah, so I mean, we'll sweep. 30 to 40 inches, you know, that's another 10 inches over 14 feet. You know, that's, I mean, those signs could get pretty big. Some of those signs are pretty clear now from the road just driving by. I mean, B Legends might be, again, unfortunate because <clears throat> just the way they designed their sign, perhaps. But, I mean, I don't see an issue with it. I was just curious if we if we considered a total square footage versus a, a set not. dimension. We have none. Okay. Um, sorry, one more question, if I can remember what it was. But um, I'll pass. I'm sure I'll think of it. Think so. of it. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Heslop. Uh, yeah. A couple questions more about the parking. So the original plans for the apartments was seven buildings, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So was parking not, are you telling us that there was not adequate parking if all seven buildings had been built? You know, I wasn't involved in the, in the development. I think right. most people that were maybe have their own opinions on if it was done properly or not, okay. but. All right, what about the parking? I was over there last night, drove around. The parking where the townhouses are, that area back there, uh, I noticed that that was sparsely filled. Is that parking totally reserved for the town, the people that live in the townhouses, or can it not be used for the apartments? It can be used for the apartments as well. Okay. It's the, any of the residential, as we're trying okay, to Okay, because there weren't a lot of cars in that parking lot. I would just, and then behind the back two buildings, there weren't a lot of cars back there. And then the third question would be, you've got covered parking provided, okay? Is there gonna be covered parking here? There will not be covered parking. Okay. Covered parking's on a reserved basis, typically for the residential units. And, and the goal is just like in, you know, in your driveway, you, you don't want cross traffic. So we like to have designated residential parking areas, mm -hmm. visitor parking, and then parking for your commercial tenants. And then to Robert's question about the slab, is it gonna be set where when you build building number seven, are you gonna have to come in and tear out that slab again and do pre-engineered, or is it gonna be built to build on top? I would imagine you're gonna need to tear it out. I mean, you're gonna okay. pour a eight inch, you know, six inch, eight inch slab for parking, and you're gonna, depending on how your building's designed, where your structure points are, you're gonna have to put footers in much deeper than that. So okay. yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, I don't think it'd be possible to, build a building foundation and then stripe it. Okay. Anybody else, Robert, did you find your question? I think I answered it, but I'll just ask. So, I mean, we, we approve this, or if we approve this tonight, it comes back a second time. Uh, any, any improvements that they wanna do to ma match this revision is still gonna have to come in front of a site plan, as part of a site plan for a new parking lot? or things like that? They'll have to submit, they'll have to submit civil drawings, yeah. In okay, a and then I guess my other question is, was just on the new signage. So is this, this is applicable to all the signage, mm -hmm. existing and future signage, right? So retroactively, Moving forward. B Legends can go put a bigger sign now than, than they have currently, right? After the second read. Right. Okay, the, well, the new if and when it gets approved. Yeah. Okay, that was it. Okay. Mr. Just one last quick question because I, I didn't, I, I've not been able to go back and watch the PNZ meeting, but uh, the vote I think was three to one. What was the, the one dissent? What was it for? Was there I a reason given? I believe it was the height of the signage, the 30 inches to the okay, 40 yeah, inches, I think possibly encroaching and opening a, a door to 50 inches or 60 inches in okay. the future. But I think the counter argument to that, not to preempt it was, you know, if that does come back for 50 inches, then we can always just say no, right? So, um, sorry, that was nope. <laughs> that was what I heard from the meeting. That's so. what I wanted to know. That's correct, I was at the meeting. Okay. All right, anybody else have any questions? Is, anybody, uh, is your light on, still on or is your? I am done with questions. I was okay. gonna make a motion. If okay, I could. please. I would like to make a motion that we approve. Um, 
Would we approve it? We would approve ordinance 2022-1293 as proposed in the revised ordinance. Second. All right, council, we have um, a motion and a second. Dan seconded it. Anybody else? Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. On current projects and discussion of future agenda items. Council, does anyone have anything? Okay. Are there any updates? Anybody? I do. Yeah, I guess just the question on the visitor's comment that we received what's the plan going forward on this issue? Scott, I've met quite a bit yesterday and today uh, going forward. Of course, the, the rain that we got, we got a heavy concentration of rain in a short time period. Mm -hmm. And it's always easy to say, well, that caused it. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. There's a few things to work out, some things to clarify with the homeowners. Uh, and it may require a couple of meetings with them going forward, but, uh, but we will be working to, to get that done. Do we have any, any indication of what kind of year storm that was that we had? What it would be classified as? It's more than a 100 year storm for sure. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Mm. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have anything? Mayor, you have anything? Okay, well then you can hit the gavel and say this meeting is adjourned. This meeting is adjourned. At 8, oh, yeah, 7.40. At 7.40. Yeah. Okay.